seriously. So okay. as I sometimes tell my students, what you might want to do then is when I add additional information that wasn't on the slide, you might want to put that in on a, a sheet of paper that would help you. But apart from that, uh, let's proceed. Again, I'm going to take it step by step. And the idea here is how do we relay the, the, dangerous, uh, the dangerous effect that this particular bill could have? And we're going to take it step by step. And, and picture that you are talking to someone. How would you do it? You might be a politician or an educator. Well, the first thing you want to know, uh, and you can mix these things up, but I'm suggesting the easiest fashion would be to let them know what the bill is. It's Bill 67. It's the Racial Equity and Education Systems Act. Then you might want to go through the history of the bill. So we're just giving context here. So the context that you'll want to give is that uh, it has already passed second reading in Queen, at Queen's Park, which is the um, legislature for the province of Ontario. It's gone through second reading, and it will now go into committee. Uh, in committee, it will be reviewed, and then after being reviewed in committee, it will go for third reading and potentially become law. Part of the history that needs to be known as you're articulating this to people is that none of the major parties, none of the major parties voted against this. Even Doug Ford's progressive conservatives voted in favor of this. Now that's particularly interesting because the bill itself was drafted and promoted by the NDP. So what does that say? It says that it may simply pass through committee uh, with, with very little attention drawn to the problems and it could be bound for third reading and then to become law. So that's the background that you want to share with people, the name and the history. Step two. Oops, sorry, step two. I actually broke, um, broke step two into two. This one is optional. So you've already explained the name of the bill and its history. You might want to question the person with whom you're speaking, first of all, to prime them or situate them morally. Uh, we sometimes do this in persuasion theory, where you actually get the person. It's like when uh, you go to see a used car salesman and they get you saying yes before they even start talking to you about cars. It really is to situate you in a particular mindset. Now, we're not trying to be immoral here. What we're trying to do is actually let the person, uh, before they enter into the thoughts around this bill, let them situate themselves morally to see where they would stand. So two questions you could ask. Should someone be judged as an individual or according to the group to which they belong? Well, most people in a free democratic society would say that you should not be judged uh, according to the group to which you belong, but everyone should be judged individually. So you could prime your audience with that, whether it's a politician or an educator. Secondly, should someone be discriminated against because of an immutable trait? Now, the majority of people are quite fair, and they would say no. Uh, they would find that reprehensible. So you can actually prime your audience with questions like that. If you're writing an op-ed or a letter, you might not be able to use this strategy, but in conversation, it actually can be fairly beneficial. So that's uh, part A of step two. Let's see the, the part that isn't an option, uh, step two B. So at step 2B, what we want to do is we actually want to make a claim about this bill. Remember earlier we said the name of the bill, and we also said uh, that it had this history. Now we're making a claim about the bill. And you want to explain to your audience that the bill purports to be a bill that will fight racism in our public school. But in fact, it will promote racism. A good metaphor to use, and again, we often can remember things better with metaphors. A good metaphor to use uh, to make this more sticky or to make it resonate in the minds of your audience is to say that this bull, uh, this bill is a wolf in sheep's clothing. And the subclaim here is the bill purposely uses omission of information and manipulative language to misrepresent its true intent. So we move from this is a bill, now I'm making a claim about the bill. 
It doesn't do what it says it will do. It says it will fight racism. In fact, it will promote racism. Well, now you actually have to move to supporting that claim. And John has expertly touched on some of these things already. What you need to do at this point is to actually provide the evidence from the bill itself to show that indeed it will promote racism. So you'll remind your audience that the bill says its main objective is to promote anti-racism in public school classrooms. But then point out that the definition of anti-racism, as it's found in this bill, and as John pointed out already, is a deception. It has a purposeful omission that would, would allow racism to flourish. And we look specifically at Section 1. Section 1 says that anti-racism means the policy of opposing racism, including anti-Indigenous racism, anti-Black racism, anti-Asian racism, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia. But you will point out to your audience, be it politician or educator, that one racial group is purposely excluded in that definition. And John, again, has touched on this already. So it endorses or it allows for racism against white people. Uh, the second proof that you would want to highlight to your audience is that the bill repeatedly uses the term equity or racial equity rather than racial equality. And that's no mistake. Uh, if equity is not equality, and most of you here in the audience today would know that, but some people are still not privy to that particular distinction. Equality means treating everybody the same. Equity means treating people differently, unequally, according to their race. And that is the essence of anti-racism. They want equity. They want equity, which means being able to discriminate. So now you've supplied these uh, proofs. There's more proof that you could give from the bill, of course, but again, I'm trying to do a minimal facts argument. So now let's move on to step number four. You've provided proof of your claim. Where do we go now? At this point, if you're talking to someone who's been uninitiated in this topic, they're not going to understand where all this is coming from. Uh, people of goodwill would be saying, but it says anti-racism. They don't realize that anti-racism is not the equivalent of non-racist. It's, it's something different altogether. So, listen, if you know a great deal about this topic already, you may be tempted in this conversation, this hypothetical conversation you're having, you may be tempted to trace the ideas of anti-racism as they appear in this bill all the way back to Marxism and critical theory. But for simplicity, we're not doing that tonight. Um, instead, you want to focus more on current events, where this is coming from in the last few years. And that's why what we want to do is talk about how this is, is generating out of uh, a pedagogical movement from the last few years. So this current movement of scholarship, it typically goes by the title of critical race theory. Now, you, you don't want to spend time in the weeds here. But that you, you probably can't avoid mentioning that this, the larger body, the, the larger educational movement, pedagogical movement, is critical race theory. So you introduce it, but don't dwell on it. And while the larger pedagogical movement is critical race theory, it actually is packaged for public consumption and, and to, to win a, in, approval, in fact, using the purposely... I would say misleading term, anti-racism. And it, it seems to be uh, in some ways intentional that, that people would just give it the benefit of the doubt. The proponents of this ideology are hoping to capitalize on the goodwill of the population who hate racism, but they don't understand the true ideas surrounding anti-racism. So just to bring all that together, critical race theory is the academic expression of the body of ideas, the larger theory as it's promoted in the academy. But anti-racism is the more common title when the ideas are discussed in public. And that's what we see in this bill. So now, now you've done a little bit of work in the definitional area, 
But to understand the true ideas of anti-racism, you have to look to the written work of its most well-known advocates, the advocates of the movement. So again, what we're doing here is saying the pedigree. We're not spending a lot of time on critical race theory. We're moving to the people who are popularizing it today. And let's talk about those people. So now, as you're explaining it, you say, this message of anti-racism actually finds some of its uh, most articulate unveiling in the works of Robin D'Angelo and Ibram Kendi. And these two uh, books, and the books themselves, Robin D'Angelo's are White Fragility. I may have mentioned it in the last slide. Yes, D'Angelo's is White Fragility, and Kendi's book, How to Be Anti-Racist. So there's the title itself. You know that this is the text. And these are the best-selling texts in the world on this topic. So what are, these what are these texts saying? Well, to summarize, Kendi and D'Angelo's work uh, and the message of anti-racism education overall, first of all, number one, it explicitly denounces whites and advocates discrimination against them. And two, it implicitly claims that people of color can't succeed on an equal playing field without rigging the game. And of course, that's a form of racism itself. It's the insidious racism of lower expectations. It's suggesting that uh, people of color do not have agency. So where do we, how do we prove this summary? We look at the quotes from, from D'Angelo and Ibram Kendi himself. So in her work, D'Angelo tells us that only whites exercise power, and thus only whites can be racist. Moreover, she demonizes whites, saying they're inherently racist, prone to oppressing others. Here's the quote that shows that. Robin D'Angelo says, a positive white identity is an impossible goal. White identity is inherently racist. White people do not exist outside the system of white supremacy. There are numerous others, but there's just a representative quote so that if someone is wondering, if you, if you have that quote, that's enough to, to make that case. Moving on to Kendi, in his book, Kendi categorically rejects the idea of treating all people equally. What FAIR itself would stand for, by the way. Instead, he insists that we make society equitable. There's that word again. Not equal, but equitable. Therefore, whites must be denied equal treatment and be made to pay for any past historical wrongs. Here's what uh, Ibram Kindi says from his book. The only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. In this quote, we can see he advocates discrimination, but he makes it noble by putting the pre uh, prefix on it, anti-racist discrimination. Of course, there's no difference. So now we've moved to step four, and we've, we've built the case, if you want to remember where we've come from, we, we're, we're talking about the context of the bill, its name, its history. We then moved into the claim that it is not what it pre uh, pretends to be. Then we gave evidence of that from the bill itself. Then we said, here is where the, the ideas of the bill are generating from at step four. Now let's go to step five. So at step five, we want to detail the extent to which this ideology will control education if Ontario, in Ontario if the bill becomes law. We've shown that it's a problem. We know that it has these definitions, but what will it do to education? And again, this comes directly from the bill itself. And it says that it's going to compel new teachers to receive training vindicating this practice. So we know that these ideas that discrimination is good are going to be mandatory training for new teachers. And secondly, if you want to advance as a teacher, you are going to have to promote these ideas because the bill states, a performance appraisal of a teacher shall include competencies related to a teacher's anti-racism awareness and the teacher's efforts to promote, promote racial equity. And in this, anti-racism, racial equity, these are almost synonymous terms. 
It means the idea that um, you could prejudice against a white student, and that's a good thing, or you could suggest to uh, a student of color that they were somehow didn't have full agency and that uh, were not uh, at the level of competency of others. And, and that's what's looking, uh, uh, that's what you're going to be appraised on, these kind of ideas. So then we move to step six. And at step six, you've laid out the case. Actually, before I go there, just so I don't get your reading, what you've done is you've said, this ideology will permeate our education system. That's what you're doing at step five. And then you want to move to really the, the closed in case, as it were. You want to move to this idea, here's what potentially could happen. What will this do to our students? And now with that bit of introduction, so we've, we've got a general explanation of the damage this kind of ideology does to students. And then I have some specifics here as well. Uh, in terms of the general, well, we know that there will be psychological trauma to students. Because, for example, white students will be told, regardless of their socioeconomic status, or even a country of origin, under this bill, white students will be condemned for the collective guilt of their ancestors and for unearned white privilege. You can imagine um, a, a student who's a white student coming from um, a home with a single mom, uh, barely enough to put food on the table, and told that they in fact are an oppressor and are the, uh, the whole, they um, embody white privilege. But conversely, it's equally toxic for students of color. They're told that they're victims and they are less likely to succeed without outside intervention. That too is a pathology. So those are the general problems. But now let me tell you a little bit about the research into this. So we do have research, empirical evidence, uh, that shows the teaching of anti-racist pedagogy actually doesn't do what it says it does. And I'll give you one example. In 2019, there was a study published in the Journal of Experimental Psychology. And uh, I've got the quote there, but let me just tell you a little bit more about how they did this study. What they did is they gathered a participant pool, and then they taught them about or they taught them anti-racist pedagogy. In particular, they focused on the idea of white privilege. So they, they taught the participants using anti-racist pedagogy, they taught them about white privilege. And then they wanted to gauge their attitudes toward race after they had received that instruction. So the participants were uh, given a story about uh, there were two different stories. One was a story about um, a poor black man who was struggling and on welfare. And another was a story about a poor white uh, individual. And then they were, they were asked to comment about their feelings toward that, that person in the story. So that was how this was tested. It was tested a, a few other ways as well, but that was primarily the test. And what was found was that when people were, the participants of the study, were divided according to their social values, whether they were conservative or, or progressive, the, the difference, there were differences. Now, those who were conservative, uh, the study found that those people who were conservative or right-leaning in their values were unaffected by the anti-racist instruction. They didn't feel more sympathy for disadvantaged blacks, and it was fairly neutral related to the disadvantaged whites. But shockingly, the study found that those who were progressive or liberal in their values, who underwent this anti-racist lesson on white privilege, were identical to the conservatives in that they did not feel any more sympathy for disadvantaged black people. They didn't. However, there was a big difference. The instruction they received made them significantly less sympathetic to disadvantaged white people. It actually made them more hostile toward them. Here's the quote from one of the study's uh, lead researchers. 
uh, Aaron Cooley from Col Colgate University. Here's what he said. I'm reading from the screen. What we found startling was that white privilege lessons didn't increase liberals' sympathy for poor black people. Instead, these lessons decreased liberals' sympathy for poor white people. This would mean that the sort of social justice training, or we could call it anti-racist training programs, offered by numerous universities, or potentially our public schools, could be having an undesirable effect. Well, I think he's being very generous there. In fact, we would suggest from this uh, that it does have an undesirable effect. So that would be a, a piece of empirical evidence that you could use when you were having this conversation with your uh, politician or educator or friends. And now I move to the final step, and I thank you for your patience on this. It's a call to action. Uh, of course, I began this by saying this is a way to package your arguments to make it more palatable and easy to understand for those who probably have not been initiated or, or steeped in this ideology. So where you want to go with this is be bold. And you want to speak with friends and educators and politicians. And as is the mandate of FAIR, you want to do it in a positive way and say that there is a way to, to promote the ideas of equality where everyone benefits. And then secondly, in terms of the call to action, you want to seek out political parties uh, that will advance a, a pro-human agenda and not this anti-racist or so-called anti-racist agenda. So that's everything I have. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, David. That was super helpful. And Tao, who I should have introduced at the beginning of the meeting, um, is our tech support person, and she has said that she can put it on the website for us right. um, to make it available there. So thank you so much for that. Um, so in a minute, we'll have questions, but um, just before, yes, Michael, the clapping, it's 